Hi everyone, welcome to this session of video classrooms. Uh, in this session, we will be seeing a short story, Average Waves in Unprotected Waters by Anne Taylor. This story actually features in the book Spectrum, Literature and Contemporary Issues for fourth semester UG Common Course English program. As this is one comprehension text, uh, certain things are to be mentioned in the opening. This is a participatory session where you, the students, the listeners are to participate in this session. This is comprehension reading, which means you will be reading the text and you will be understanding. This session will be just you know, a guideline will be just a help and assistance to you understanding the text well. So, we will move to uh, the session through the slides. First of all, Anne Tyler, she is an American writer, a novelist, short story writer and literary critic, still alive. Okay, since her younger days onwards, she had displayed great interest in literature, painting and storytelling. She now lives in, in the States, Baltimore, Maryland. Here is a photograph. We will we'll, we'll, uh, have a, a glimpse through you know, her famous novels and awards. Her first novel, If Morning Ever Comes, was published in 1964 and her early writings brought her widespread critical attention as I already mentioned you know she was she started writing as a student herself and uh, she established herself as a good writer and this uh, brought her wide critical attention. And now the next novel is The Accidental Tourist in 1985 which was awarded the National Book Critics Circle Award and Breathing Lessons in 1988 was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1989. She is also called a Southern author. Southern author because you know she was brought up and educated primarily in the Southern part of America and her writings, her novels reflect that. Taylor is called okay, a Southern novelist, Southern author and an American author. Then she is well known for her ability and tendency, propensity for writing about ordinary people. Okay? She does not write about heroes, okay? great okay, um, uh, heroes and superheroes, but she is always writing about ordinary people, laymen and laywomen uh, in her novels and short stories. Several, uh, several of her novels were adapted as movies. And we will we'll, uh, have a uh, very brief introduction to the chapter. You know, having an autistic baby or a developmentally disabled baby in the home is not a welcome thing. No family welcomes it quite wholeheartedly because such children will be always uh, troubling, disturbing the families in, in many ways. Okay? And uh, such children are often abandoned by parents or those such children are at times sent to asylums, hospitals and mentally challenged or mentally retarded, mentally, mentally disabled children and their parents are marginalized in many societies, even okay, so called modern developed or civilized societies, okay, are mentally challenged children are, and their parents are getting marginalized. And average waves in unprotected waters the story which we are going to look deeply into uh, was published in, in the New Yorker in 1977 which presents a similar issue. 
what are the points of views uh, used in the <coughs> story? Actually, this story, this average waves in unprotected waters, uses the point of view of a single mother, you know, single mother, <coughs> um, a mother uh, bringing up the child all along. Okay, it brings or the, the story uh, narrates through the point of view of a single mother, third person narrative, point of view it is. Then what are the major themes in it? <coughs> single parenting, absent fathers, uh, in the story you come across, you know, an absent father. Then the identity, question of identity and self-discovery as it happens at the end of the story. <coughs> and <coughs> memory plays a very important role in almost all the fictions of Taylor, Tyler and Taylor. Taylor, uh, in, this, in this story too, the same is true about, uh, you know, uh, Anne Taylor. Now, how does she treat family? Uh, in, in, uh, in, in fiction, in this fiction, um, you know, uh, the family functions as a contradictory force. Okay, family nurtures and sustains an individual, individual's identity, and at the same time, it shatters, it disturbs, strips, the individual of his or her own identity too. Now, it's a turn of reading, primary reading, cursory reading. Okay, what you have to do is read the text. Okay, please keep the text open, and please read the entire text from the opening to the end rapidly. Okay, that's why we call it cursory reading. Second thing you have to bear in mind is that please mark unfamiliar words and phrases using a pencil or any other marker, please mark the unfamiliar words and phrases in the text. Then try to comprehend the text in totality as good as you can. Okay, please try to understand the text. In this text, you need not go into the details of the text. You needn't uh, go into the depths of the text. Please do read the text and uh, try to understand it on the, on the surface level. Okay. This is the reading time. Now, please open your text and read the text. Okay. Uh, one or two things to, uh, to, to be borne in mind. Number one, please read the whole story from the beginning to the end sincerely. Spend some, some minutes for that. Number two, once you are reading the text, you are participating in this class, okay, in this session. And please do not forget that there is no other substitute for you reading the primary text. I hope all of you have read the text rapidly and you have marked the unfamiliar words and phrases and idioms for you. Please do mark your text gives a glossary, a list of glossary uh, at the end of the chapter. These are some, some words, some phrases and idioms from the text that I am listing for, uh, for helping you to understand the text better. Uh, maybe there are some more words, please do find their meanings from any, any dictionary. Okay. Now we will see some of these words. The first word that I have listed is goggling. Goggling is, you know, as, as, is, as it has been already uh, explained in, the, in your text, uh, is looking intently with desire, with lust, with a strong desire for someone, something. Okay. Actually, Ann Taylor, Ann Taylor uses this one, this term, goggling, to talk about Arnold, that child looking at the mirror, okay, goggling at the mirror as if he had been watching it, he had been seeing it for the first time. Now, this is the first word, goggling, goggled, okay, goggle, goggling, goggled, okay. There's a reference to orthopedic shoes, orthopedic shoes, worn by Mrs. Puckett, the neighbor, orthopedic. Orthopedic actually means, you know, um, it's a branch of study, okay, medicine, which cures the disorders of the skeleton or bone. People do wear special, uh, specially designed shoes or chapels for orthopedic disorders, okay. So she has worn orthopedic shoes, okay, just to um, cure some of her uh, disorders of uh, skeleton, maybe, or bone. The next word is jabber, jabbered, okay. What we have to bear in mind is that Ann Taylor is uh, talking about 
a child a developmentally disabled child a child whose language is not developed whose okay mental faculties are not developed so what is what he is doing is that at every now and then he is producing certain sounds okay meaningless sounds maybe to communicate or maybe just okay just to produce certain sounds jabbering talking in an incomprehensible way we do not know uh, how far it's it's a sort of talking at all maybe it's an expression from his side jabbered talked okay in an incomprehensible way so three words gogling orthopedic and jabbered now clogged what is clogging clogging is a common word where you know uh, a, 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 a pipe or, or or a tunnel or something is clogged is blocked with an accumulation of thick matter clogged okay so uh, here mother bet bet blevins is talking about arnold's mother bet blevins is talking about her fear where arnold would be swallowing gum chewing gum spearmint gum which would be uh choking or clogging getting clogged in his uh, throat okay so clogged means getting blocked blocked with an accumulation of thick matter next word is jittery jittery means nervous nervous there's a phrase where and taylor the author describes the way he sleeps in the train this arnold this babe sleeps in the train okay it's a jittery jerky catnap jittery means nervous you know when he sleeps it's not a calm okay very 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 cool uh, action from his side it's a jittery action it's a nervous action okay it's a jerky action so jittery means nervous then there's a part in the story where bet blevins remembers her childhood her parents her house where she was brought up actually it was not too much of a ha- house it was it was a truck of a vehicle you know trailer trailer is actually the the container part of a huge truck where people live you know after some time somebody would be once it becomes um, uh, a, a a thrown away uh, piece um, um, uh, people will be using it as a vehicle uh, this way uh, as as a living, living or uh, will be using it for either for uh, living or traveling okay so trailer is actually this this um, container okay where people are uh, i mean where where uh, bed blevins her father and uh, brother her family live together now gurgling gurgling is uh, the again the sound made by this baby okay this arnold okay uh, ma- ma- making uh, a sound of satisfaction okay there are there are different uh, noises or sounds produced by this babe this child in the in the story so gurgling is one such a sound when he is happy he cannot express it normally okay through his normal communication linguistic communication so what does he do he makes a sound of satisfaction he gurgles okay then tantrums there are moments when this boy undergoes great fits of bad temper evil temper okay he loses his t- temper okay he 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 gets agitated excited okay okay he he cries shouts so tantrums fits of bad temper so lurched okay lurched down is the phrase lurched down lurched down is actually moving moving in an unsteady way okay a sudden making a sudden unsteady movement okay through the through the um, veranda in the office i think in the office of the hospital um, that Uh, bet blevins takes this child to now baby sat baby sat is a common word which is the past form of v2 form of baby sit baby sit okay you know um, a, 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 a take will be a caretaker will be sitting by a babe and okay baby sitter okay baby sat is the v2 form of baby sit then cat nap cat nap cat nap nap itself means a short sleep cat nap means you know uh sleeping like a cat okay not very deep okay uh very just just uh, it's it's not um uh, it, it's it's like sleeping like a lo- uh, dog 
okay not sleeping like a log sleeping like a dog okay cat nap a short sleep so when antila talks about the sleep of this child uh, you know this is the phrase i mean this is the word she uses to talk about it cat nap and chortle 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 chortling laughing pleasantly um, there is one more phrase used by here la laying l a l a l a y i n g la laying and chortling okay this this boy is la laying and chortling chortling means laughing pleasantly okay and there are three more words one is this is a common word whimper this child you know uh, these are some of the words through which the author uh, familiarizes us introduces to us the way in which this child communicates with the outer world okay one is whimpering making weak sounds okay expressing either fear or pain then body surf body surf is actually an art in which a a a, a swimmer uh, would be you know riding riding a wave not using a sur surfboard okay they'll be they'll be uh, fa facing facing a wave okay without having a surfboard uh, on their body uh, it's it's a sort of floating on the water okay riding without a surfboard okay body surf body surf you know uh, is used here when beth blevins remembers her childhood where she was brought up uh, on a, on a coastal area okay on the seashore by her father and the last adjective is enormous common very very common adjective enormous is uh, opposite of tiny small large in size okay it means large in size we'll move to select phrases and idioms in the chapter the first one is set someone off which means that to make someone to cause someone start doing something for example hearing of football sets my uncle off to non stop talking hearing of football okay sets my uncle off to which means that until he listens to that until he comes across that he might be silent he might not be uh, that um, actively indulging in talk but once he listens to this one he mm, uh, he 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 starts violently or hectically start uh, speaking next one this, uh, this is about this is about um, the child okay um which beth blevins tells us you know there are certain things which sets him into sets him off okay that sets him into active uh, moments next one is gave him the chills almost something something similar gave him the chills frightened him there are certain things say for example when he sleeps if somebody touches his uh, fingers his hand you know it gives him the chills it frightens him it gave him shudders okay the child is frightened okay that's that's the second phrase now there are certain phrases in the uh, in the story which the author uh, uses to talk about the way the mother beth blevins cares for her for her uh, child so nails as smooth as thumb thumb tack heads thumb tack thumb is actually a pin with a flat head thumb tack heads thumb tack heads are something very very smooth so actually this literally means that very smooth nails as smooth as thumb tack heads sorry thumb tack heads which means uh, which means that she has been keeping or polishing uh, the nail of her son quite um uh, quite quite carefully that they, uh, they they look very smooth then next one is clattering wheels you know uh, one thing we have to bear in mind is that this uh, boy is uh, traveling for the first time uh, in the train and uh, he has he is slightly nervous about that and um, the, the, this is the moment where the mother is talking about uh, or uh, is describing the the sound produced by the train wheels clattering wheels okay the, this is an onomatopoeic word a word which gives us the sound effect effect of the sound okay in itself clattering wheels a continuous rattling sound produced by the wheels another one is sounded like a parrot 
this is where um, the, the protagonist of the story, Beth Blevins, talks about the lady, the lady in, in purple coat, the tiny lady in purple coat inside the train compartment, uh, the lady who had been talking without the, I mean, the lady who had been traveling without the tickets in the train, uh, having a uh, conversation with the ticket examiner and she had been calling him some terms, okay, which sounded like a parrot, a common phrase in, uh, in our mother tongue even, speaking someone else's words without knowing what they mean, okay, speaking someone else's words, uh, using, using somebody else's words without knowing their meanings. Then muttering under one's breath, murmur indistinctly. Uh, this is uh, what uh, almost all of us do at times, okay? Muttering under um, one's breath. We uh, murmur something, mutter something, utter something, which, uh, you know, we'll be talking to ourselves, which uh, will be indistinct for others. Then, next phrase is this one, uh, couldn't stand it, cannot stand, can stand could stand, meaning stand here means tolerate, put up with, okay. Could not stand means could not put up with, okay, could not tolerate. He was, uh, he couldn't tolerate the abusive words uh, used by him, used by her, okay. Couldn't stand means she was not able to put up with, she was not able to tolerate the abusive words used by him. Then flung back in the corner, flung back in the corner actually means, you know, uh, thrown back to the corner, okay, move, uh, uh, moved back to the corner, Fli fling, flung, you know, flung back in the corner. This, this one, this phrase describes the baby uh, inside the taxi, okay, inside the taxi when she takes the taxi cab from the railway station to Parkins City Hospital, okay, flung back in the corner. He, he sits, you know, quite casually uh, in, the, in the taxi seat. Now, pivoting back and forth, pivoting back and forth. I, this, this is a movement, physical movement of the boy described by the, by the mother, okay, pivoting back. Pivoting means, you know, oscillating like a shaft, shaft of a machine, okay, pivoting back and forth. He was, he was moving, okay, back and forth like a machine, like a pivot, okay, like a shaft. And this indicates how mechanically, maybe, how unpredictably this boy moves, okay, uh, back and forth or moves in his, um, uh, in his um, uh, routines, okay, in his day-to-day um, uh, -day movements. So with this, we are closing this uh, select phrases and idiom part. The next step is going to the close reading. Uh, one thing, just one thing to uh, tell you, in close reading, please read the text. Now, now you have got almost all the unfamiliar words phrases, idioms, there, there may be some more words which uh, you can either go to any dictionary or drop them for the time being and uh, um, read the text, okay. Please read the text intensively, then look for all the textual details as much as possible, okay, in this reading, okay. So please do read, okay, uh, we will be, we'll be moving to the next session after your reading, okay. After your reading, close reading of the text. We will move to the primary comprehension, how far you have understood the text. That, uh, that's what we are going to uh, check in this one, okay. What are the primary questions? Very simple ones. Who is the protagonist of the story? And as you all know, who is that? Beth Blevins. Beth Blevins, the single mother, okay. And who are the other major characters, major or minor characters in the story? Arnold Blevins, her, own, her son, nine-year-old son, okay. Then uh, Avery Blevins, her husband, okay. And Mrs. Puckett, her neighbor, elderly neighbor uh, who had babysat Arnold uh, until or uh, all these years as the story tells us. Next question, who is Arnold Blevins? Arnold Blevins is uh, actually the any the central character, okay, of the story. He is a nine-year-old boy with developmental disabilities. Uh, the thing we have to bear in mind is that uh, we can call somebody uh, an autistic case or uh, a mentally challenged case, but uh, instead if, you, if we use the phrases like developmental disabilities, uh, they suit uh, these situations better, okay. They are, they are a uh, rather more 
democratically balanced term for these types of cases. Now, fundamentals, some fundamentals. Okay. As you all know, Beth Blevins, she is a single mother. She is attempting to institutionalize her mentally challenged son. Institutionalize the term means that taking someone, taking say for example, you know, a challenged case, a disabled case, uh, a disabled individual to an institution, to a residential institution. Okay, so institutionalize is the verb you should bear in mind while you write the exam, while you talk about Arnold Blevins or Beth Blevins. Okay, so she is attempting to, she is trying to institutionalize her mentally challenged son. Then, what she, what she doing? She's, she's taking, what is she taking? You know, there are two movements actually in the story. One is a physical movement. So, in the physical movement, she's moving from the house, their home. Okay, she's taking her son from their home to Parkins State Hospital, traveling in a bus, okay, and later in a train and in a taxi. So, that's the, that's the physical movement. They, they, they are uh, starting from their home uh, in a bus and they reach a railway station. Then from the railway station, uh, she takes a taxi to this Parkins State Hospital. So that's the physical movement. Then, uh, how does she? Uh, uh, how is this physical movement uh, portrayed? You know, she says goodbye, or they say goodbye to Mrs. Puckett, an elderly neighbor who had babysat Arnold. Okay. Now we'll we'll see uh, just uh, a very uh, uh, threadbare. Um, uh, description of uh, your uh, plot, plot of the story. Okay. The, the second movement the story gives us is the mental movement, okay, in which this Beth Blevins, the protagonist, travels through her childhood, her parents, her family, her husband, her fate of having this sort of a child. Okay. So, uh, actually that movement, that mental movement fills a major portion of the story. In the train, she thinks of her dead parents, her childhood, especially her father, how he trained her for body surfing. Okay? Her father was trying to train her for body surfing, to, to, uh, to float above waves, to float on the crest of waves without using this uh, surfing board. Okay? But uh, she, she, uh, she was not good at that and how she learned the virtue of standing staunch. Okay, she was not good at that and she, she uh, prepared herself or she rather learned the art of the virtue of standing firmly, standing staunch. Okay, when a wave comes, she learned the art of standing staunch. Okay. Now, uh, in addition to that, she thinks of Avery Blevins. Avery Blevins is her husband, her absent husband. Absent husband in the sense that you know she is no, no, no more with the family, no more with uh, Blevins, uh, Beth Blevins and Arnold. Okay. She thinks of their marriage, how suddenly he left her, how suddenly um, Avery left her. Now, plot in a very, very uh, um, <clears throat> nutshell form. She thinks of the condition of Arnold, her own son, thinks of who is responsible for his fate. And she thinks that maybe there is an evil gene either in her or in Avery, okay. who is to be blamed. She is almost unable to uh, reach a conclusion. They take a taxi after that, from the uh, once she is out of the train, okay. Uh, they take a taxi into the hospital. She enters Arnold, the okay, the child, the she rushes back to the railway station, and uh, she uh, she she learns that the train is 20 uh, 20 minutes late. What we have to bear in mind is that um, she uh, she she was quite sure that by the time she reaches back the station, the the train for her. Uh, uh, for her home, station would be ready there, would be waiting there. But the moment she reaches the station, actually that, that train was 20 minutes late. So she does not know what to do, how to spend her time, rather how to fight with her own, her own fears and uh, her own, her own uh, uh, feeling of you know, loneliness or her own feeling of, uh, her own sorrow okay, uh, in, in dropping her son. She does not know what to do, but a sudden unexpected program there helps her feel the time. That is how the story ends. Okay. Now, after this one, uh, so, so you get uh, a, a, a basic comprehension of the text. We will look into the literary aspects of the text. Okay. We will we'll have a detailed 
uh, look of the text. Okay. Then, you know, how is this author trying to bring to the readers uh, the fact that this is uh, this is a developmentally disabled child? Okay, and this child is unable to communicate with anyone properly, and how this lady Bedblevins is uh, finding an equation uh, with that child? Okay, how their relationship is uh, very very warm, very stable. Uh, um, how their bond is very 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 firm. And at the same time, how she takes the decision to uh, keep her son in the hospital too. So these are some of the phrases, literary phrases or verbal collocations she, she uses in the story. A knobby child. Knobby means lean, okay? Fat, fat opposite lean, thin. A thin child with great glassy eyes, okay? And, okay, shirt was too neat and the jeans too blue unpatched and unfaded you know this too neat uh, shirt too neat and jeans too blue indicates that she always wanted her son to be okay uh, to be to be very neat okay so she had been she had been always uh, trying to give him what uh, this uh, too neat dress and a jeans which was too blue unpatched and unfaded okay she she always uh, wanted to uh, communicate to the outer world the impression that she had been um, uh, very um, intensively paying attention to her, her son's even very minute details. Then his face was elderly pinched. His face was, meaning that boy's face was elderly pinched. Uh, I mean his face was, you know, elderly, um, uh, elderly looking, you know, in the sense that, you know, it was a, it was a pale face, thin face. Okay, elderly pinched means you know uh, with, with the look of an elderly, uh, aged okay person, strained, tired though. Okay, he hardly ever changed his expression. He hardly ever he never changed his expression. This child you know these are some of the expressions through which the author gives us the picture of the child, the boy. A rented room in an ancient crumbling house. You know it indicates her financial status. Okay, how pathetic her. Uh, condition, total condition was crumbling house. She was living in a rented house that was a crumbling house. Okay, her dress a worn beige knit. She usually a, a, a worn beige knit. She usually saved for Sundays. You know? So she uh, this indicates in the opening that she is going to do something special on the day because she is wearing that dress she has kept for Sundays. She is wearing that uh, this day that dress specially for taking her son to the hospital. He crowed and pulled. At her sleeve, that that boy, okay, um, is is crowing and pulling at her sleeve. She felt too slight and frail, too wispy for all she had to do today. You know, she is not she is not um, wholeheartedly willing to drop her son. Okay, she is not wholeheartedly uh, uh, willing to institutionalize her son. There are still something, uh, so, still some internal conflicts pulling her backward. She felt too slight and frail, too weak. Okay. Too, too, too thin for all she had to do today. What is that she is doing today especially? She is uh, um, taking her son to the institution and uh, she is uh, making him stay there. Arnold's gaze turned wild and she knew he had heard. Okay, Arnold's gaze turned wild and she knew he had heard. This is how the author tells us that, you know, uh, how a child who is unable to communicate uh, through language is expressing his, uh, uh, himself okay now she had to struggle to stuff his arms in the sleeves you know this is how a mother is making you know this child is nine years old not not very young he can normally wear his a, a child of nine years old can normally wear his shirt but he being uh, a developmentally disabled child he uh, he str she struggles to mother struggles to stuff his arms in the sleeve okay small though he was he was strong and wiry okay strong he was okay thin and strong he was he was going to be too much for her he was going to be too much for her. She, she cannot tolerate him uh, anymore how he stood inside his clothes separate from them passive unaware of all the buttons and snaps uh, she had fastened carefully as she would a doors okay two things to be borne in mind this is what she feels the mother feels once she makes her own son wear the dress okay she feels that she had been okay helping a doll to wear the dress. Now, he came, 
meaning um, this, this boy came dragging out every step, okay, dragging out every step. It's, it's going on the train with us. That's how the mother, you know, this is a baby talk language. It's, it's going on this briefcase. She is talking about the briefcase. It's going out, going on the train with us. This briefcase is, we are, it's not, we are carrying this briefcase, but uh, instead, you know, in the, in the baby language, she tells it's going on the train with us. Her voice was all wrong, literary language, okay. Um, uh, her, her voice was all wrong. So Arnold, this baby, stood gaping at the vaulted ceiling with his flopped back and his arms hanging limp at his side. People stared at him, okay. So these are all some of the expressions through which, uh, some of the literary verbal collocations through which the author gives us the picture of the, draws the picture of the baby. He loved gum. Arnold, the baby, loved the uh, gum. If, uh, if she didn't watch him closely, he sometimes swallowed it, which worried her a little, you know, he swallowed it. Then, his jittery, jerky cat naps. How this mother observes, the, uh, you know, her, her, her own son's jittery, jerky cat naps. Avery, this is how, you know, uh, the author tells us about uh, how a uh, Avery, how their family broke. Avery, meaning her husband, just walked in wide circles around the crib, looking stunned and sick. A few weeks later, he left. Okay, a few weeks later, you know, it's, it's a sudden action. A few weeks later, he left. She was not surprised. Okay. Now, there are some more uh, verbal collocations like um, marriage turned grim and cranky. Okay. She, she uses very sharp phrases to talk about uh, this marriage, their relationship, the marriage. Okay. Halfway, he blamed her. Halfway, he blamed himself. You can't believe a thing like this will just fall on you out of nowhere. This is how these types of, you know, uh, things happen in people's life. Okay, you, you, you don't expect uh, out of the blue, all on a sudden, all these things, okay, fall on your head. Some kind of evil gene. She, she is trying to rationalize, you know, how she came to uh, suffer from, how her son came to suffer from this developmental disability. Maybe there's an evil gene, a dark little egg, like a black jelly bean. Other times, she blamed their marriage. Okay, these are, again, some of, some of her expressions. Then she thinks of her father. Her father, who had run a f uh, fishing boat for tourists, couldn't arrange his day till he had heard the marine forecast. Okay, so she is now remembering her father. Her father was, you know, an ordinary human being. He was not a hero. He was an ordinary human being. So, he, uh, he, he would be, you know, as he was uh, uh, working uh, as a tourist uh, guide, as, as he was, uh, you know, uh, he, he was running a fishing boat for tourists, okay, uh, he had been listening to all these things. He had been uh, watching for these uh, marine forecasts, the, the wind, the tides, the small craft warning, the height of average waves in unprotected waters. You know, um, being an ordinary human being, uh, he couldn't, um, uh, he, he, uh, he, uh, uh, he couldn't walk into unprotected waters without looking for the height of average waves there. So that was the way he looked into dangers in his life. Actually, this is this phrase, the, the height of average, I mean, average waves in unprotected waters is the title of the story, which indicates that this, this lady, Beth Blevins, has learned the primary lessons of her life, okay, how to, how to take life, how to meet life from her own father. She just took some comfort from enduring. This is another central sentence in the, uh, uh, in the, in the story. She just took some comfort from enduring. That's, that's what an ordinary human being can do. Not a superhero, okay, uh, as, as in a movie, coming and solving all the issues. Uh, not like that. A, a uh, um, you know, human being, an ordinary human being will be just taking some comfort, comfort from enduring. She was always afraid that while he was screaming, meaning this child was screaming, okay, uh, he would chalk on them. He would chalk on these, okay, gums. They have got some more phrases. She waved a spidery hand. This is where... Uh, the author is talking about that lady, that tiny lady in purple coat inside the train, traveling without train. Spidery hand, you know, gives, the, gives you the uh, picture. You know, it's, it's a figurative phrase, actually. F spidery hand. Span like, uh, I mean, hand like spider. Arnold, the baby, wanted a peanut butter cookie. She wanted them to see how small and neat he was. Before taking the baby to the hospital, she was unwilling to give peanut butter 
uh, to, to Arnold because she wanted them to see how small and neat he was. But later on she gives him uh, a piece of the same. But he came finally climbing the steps. Uh, Arnold came finally climbing the steps in his little hobble way. You know, when he walks, he gave the uh, gave off the impression that uh, th there is some, some pain in his walk, in his gait. Arnold was pivoting back and forth to hear how his new sneakers, you know, uh, he, he never knew that Arnold, this uh, babe never knew that what his mother was going to do with him. So, uh, what was he doing actually? He was enjoying himself, okay, uh, listening to the squeaking noise on the carpet of the, uh, of the, of the um, hall, carpet in the hall, okay, listening to the squeaky noise, squeaky sound of the sneakers, okay, on the carpet. Then, uh, these, these are the last, okay, uh, phrases, verbal collocations. Tears seem to be coming down her face in sheets because, you know, she has been, she has been weeping too much, okay. So, she, uh, tears seem to be coming, you know, but at the same time, she is quite firm too. Uh, two things happening at the same time, okay. She is uh, undergoing great pain, okay, great anguish in dropping her son, giving up her son. But at the same time, she, uh, you know, uh, she, she is quite firm too. And in the railway station, a procession of grey suited men arrived with briefcases. Okay, from now on, all the world was going to be uh, like that, just something on a stage for, for her to sit back and watch. That's the last paragraph of the story actually, okay, uh, the last sentence of the story actually. Uh, she, she is going to be just a witness. If uh, she loses her son, maybe um, she does not have anything else to worry, bother in her life about. So, uh, uh, from now on, all the world was going to be like that, just something on a stage. Okay? She was going to be a detached witness for all these things. Okay? Now, I hope you have understood almost um, all, these, um, all these features of the text. Uh, the author, author has been using very selected words and phrases to bring in, you know, uh, maybe the inexpressible feelings of the mother, uh, the mother, and at the same time, how strong she was, how firm she was, staunch she was in her decision too. Now, we will see some more questions, okay, some more basic questions. These are the questions that are, there are of course, some questions given at the end of the chapter in your textbook spectrum, but these are uh, some some other some additional questions. Um, they might be helping you to understand the text in a better way. Why is Bet Bet Blevins institutionalizing Arnold? Why is she taking her own her own son to um, to the to the uh, hospital? Number two. What do you think of the character Mrs. Puckett? Uh, Mrs. Puckett is not of course a major character in the story, but she plays a vital role, um, especially in an American family where. Um, human relationships are always, uh, maybe can be, not always, human relationships uh, um, do not have uh, the sort of um, um, features that we have in India, in Indian society, in, in uh, Eastern societies, okay. But she comes, you know, when Arnold is uh, going out, she comes, she gives a ha hands over to him, uh, butter cookies, okay. Then what is the main conflict between in the story? What is the main conflict? I mean, is, 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 is it the conflict between Avery Blevins, the husband, and Beth Blevins, the wife? Or is it uh, the, the conflict of the lady, uh, the wife undergoing tension uh, of parting with her own son? Okay. Then what are your comments on the title, title of the story? Title should be commented, uh, commented upon seriously because, you know, Actually, um, that average waves in unprotected waters gave her uh, the, the practice, gave her the training, how to face the challenges as an ordinary human being in her day to day life. Okay? Then elaborate the phrase, stand staunch. This is actually what she learned, not directly from her father. She, uh, she, she uh, learned uh, while her father was trying to teach her body surfing. As I already uh, uh, mentioned, she was not using, uh, she was not uh, well um, adept in, in, in using uh, body surfing boards, or uh, surfing boards. So, what happened was that she was facing the waves in the waters, standing firm. So, this phrase is something very central to the story. 
then comment on the end of the story. So if you have done this much, please do one thing. Uh, please, uh, if, you have, if you have answered these questions, please give the story a final reading. Okay. Final reading means, okay, please do read the whole story once again, keeping in mind all these details that we have seen about the text. Okay, so if you have done the final reading, if your final reading is over, we will see some critical uh, reading of the text too. Number one, uh, this can be the questions you, uh, you might expect uh, for your exams. Number one is title, title of the story, average waves in unprotected waters. I told you um, th there are one or two things we have to bear in mind. In the train, Beth Blevins recalls her father, her family, her family living in a uh, coastal uh, region and her father was looking for these average waves in the unprotected waters and weather forecast. Okay? And title is important which reminds her how as an ordinary human being she has to face the challenges in life. Number two, themes, themes in the story. Themes can be, there can be various themes. Okay? Number one, how um, a de developmentally disabled child is treated, how, uh, how far he can be taken as an, or, uh, taken as an individual. Okay? Then uh, th that's one. Number two, what is family? The question of family is to be, uh, is one of the themes. There are two families actually. Number one, Beth Blevins and Avery Blevins, uh, they have broken. Whereas she quite, uh, quite pleasantly, she recalls her family uh, of her father, mother. And she, she, uh, she now re uh, realizes that that family was far freer than, was, uh, uh, than, than the family she had with Avery. Then uh, there, there are uh, issues of what memory, there are, there are questions of individuality, individuals, okay, individual identity. Now, memory is the next point. Memory, the story uh, uses flashback or in a way memory in the story where she, uh, as, I, as I told you, that's a, that's a mental movement the, the central character makes in the uh, story. Uh, and memory gives us uh, the, the, the world, actually the experience she passed through. Uh, her, her life uh, in, her, in her childhood, her parents, then her husband, her family, okay, and her own uh, fight with, um, you know, having a uh, developmentally disabled babe and all. Then family versus individual. Family versus individual is a, uh, is a central uh, question in the, in the story. Um, how far can she keep um, this babe, okay, Arnold as her as a, as a uh, son, you know, because uh, the, the, there are parts, uh, the, there, are, there are portions in the story where uh, we, we um, come across the feeling that, uh, you know, this babe, Arnold was too much for her. She cannot tolerate anymore, okay. And um, how, how far she can run the family with uh, her own son, um, Arnold, is one, one question. And how far is, can one be considered as an individual is a question. Then identity. Identity means any character, any character um, in any story or all the characters in the stories do have or do, they do represent different identities. Uh, your Beth Blevins represents one um, single mother, uh, then uh, her, her husband represents absent father, um, then uh, your Arnold Blevins represents uh, a developmentally disabled child. So all of them are in one way or other representing identity and uh, this, this, this story is in a way uh, a problematized pack of identities. So these are some of the uh, critical questions and readings that helps us, uh, that help us understanding, uh, to understand the text in a better way. Hope uh, uh, this was just helpful for you. Uh, please do read the text and um, uh, if, if there is any more questions to be asked, please contact. Thank you. Thank you for listening.